It's one of the fastest growing apps the world has ever seen that's revolutionized the way we express ourselves in a single photo. Kevin Systrom turned down a job from Mark Zuckerberg in college, shared a desk with Jack Dorsey as an intern at what became Twitter, then in 2010 launched Instagram as we know it. Just two years later, he reunited with Zuckerberg and made Silicon Valley history, agreeing to sell Instagram to Facebook for a billion dollars. The company had just 13 employees and just 30 million users. Today, over half a billion people on the planet use Instagram every month, sharing more than 95 million photos and videos a day. Joining me today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Instagram co-founder and CEO, Kevin Systrom. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us Thanks today. for having me. Great to have you. Yeah. So you were born in Holliston, Massachusetts. That's correct. What kind Home of kid of were you? Home of the Panthers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Home of the Panthers. What kind of kid were you? Nerdy. Uh, I don't know. I, I look back and um, I was really into like cross country running and. You were uh, on the lacrosse team. I was the thirds lacrosse team, so <laughs> I wouldn't exactly say I was a jock. So when did you start becoming interested in technology? I remember my dad got us our first computer. Um, at home and I just played video games all the time. <laughs> but uh, as I played those video games, I learned you could actually create your own levels. And then I learned programming was the thing and then I took classes in, in school and actually wanted to make my own games. It was something that really inspired me. I loved it. Now, more importantly, perhaps, photography. You also got involved in photography at a, at a young age. It was hard to find me at a young age without a camera in my hand. Um, whether it was my dad's Polaroid camera, I used to get in trouble because you know those packs, there would be like 10 packs of film. I would go through them and they weren't cheap, um, but I love taking photos. Uh, at least my family has a rich visual history now. And I studied in Florence uh, in college mm -hmm. and just sat in the dark room there developing photos. And, and that's actually where I learned about filtering. You actually could add these chemicals to the bath, the developing bath, and it would change the colors of the photos. Um, and I brought that along with me to Instagram. Isn't that where you also learned about square photos? Yeah, yeah. My photography teacher took my nice camera out of my hands and said, you're going to use this. And it was a plastic camera that took square uh, film format. And, uh, and I learned to love it. It was just, it was easy to take good photos in the square format. Now, while you were at Stanford, as I understand it, you had an offer to drop out of work at Facebook. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. So what happened? Uh, there was a girl involved and I didn't exactly want to leave school. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, I actually, it's amazing. I talked to a lot of my mentors at the time who said, Facebook's a fad, it'll go away. Uh, and to this day, I think about that decision. I actually think it was the right decision. Um, I loved finishing you know, Stanford, and I loved what I learned there. Um, and, but when I think about it, I think about how many technologies come about that people doubt at first. And I took that with me at Instagram, because the number of people who thought Instagram wouldn't work in the first few years, I mean, still don't think it'll work sometimes. It's kind of hard to refute at this point. But um, you just have to keep going. And that was one of the lessons as an entrepreneur. You went yeah. on to Google. You interned at Odeo, which became Twitter, working for Evan Williams and yeah. sharing a desk with Jack Dorsey. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, well, when I showed up my first day of work at Odeo, um, I got this puzzled look and they're like, oh, that's right, we hired an intern. <laughs> um, but they were super nice to me. And I, I mean, honestly, without that experience, I don't think I would have the same passion for social media that I do today. Ev's one of the smartest guys I know. Jack, super creative, an awesome engineer as well. Um, and it was great to meet them and learn from them very early on. So what did you learn from them? Number one would be sometimes your first idea doesn't work out. I worked at Odeo, not Twitter. Um, it became Twitter, but I remember very clearly, you know, Odeo not quite working. Um, and then keeping in touch with Jack and Ev as they kind of made that transition and realizing that often when you're a company, you need to actually pivot into something else. Instagram had a similar history. We, we were working on a game called Bourbon, mm -hmm. and it turned into Instagram. The first Instagram photo was of your girlfriend's foot with yeah. a stray dog. Yeah. But it was maybe the first filter that was even more consequential. Had I known that that was going to be the first photo on Instagram, <laughs> and that Instagram would get to this place where it has 500 million people using it around the world monthly, uh, I would have tried a little bit harder. My girlfriend at the time is now my wife. Um, and she said, I'm not going to post photos unless I can make them look great, so you probably should add filters. And I was like, OK, I'm going to try making a filter. I made X-Pro2, which was the first filter that, um, that we ever created. And uh, I added it to the build, and I took a photo of her foot and a stray dog. <laughs> 
and I posted it as a test, and it just lived on forever. So, how quickly did it become something that you realized could be not just big, but really big? I may have been a little bit optimistic, but the second we launched, I was like, there's something new and different here. I had worked at other companies that struggled to get 100 people to sign up in a day. And that first morning, or actually that first day, we had 25,000 people sign up. And I remember like my eyes were wide. I was like, I've never seen a service grow that quickly day one. The way we saw it, we kind of had lightning in a bottle and it was our job to capture it and to continue to work on it, not screw it up. And to this day, we think about that as our job is just keep it going. It's got a life of its own. Don't get in its way and make it awesome. Are you afraid enough? of Snapchat. the moment or the transition where you began to contemplate selling the company or became more open to the idea of selling the company? Well, this was, gosh, now like four years ago. So we were in a very different place. It was 13 people. I guess I was four years younger. Um, didn't have nearly as much experience as a CEO. When I look back about the decision to sell to Facebook, I think the pros of it are that like we got to pair up with a a juggernaut of a company that understands how to grow, understands how to build a business, has one of the best, if not the best, management team in tech. And we got to use them as our resource. So that was really the hope and the dream. And like most acquisitions don't work out that way. I mean, you can look over the past years how many acquisitions have failed. Founders have left abruptly after selling because of culture clashes, changes in vision, whatever, misalignment. We've been able to do this for now basically over four years, and that's what's awesome about that decision back then. It, like, it came true. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we got a little lucky, meaning like not many people get to get to this point, yeah. but we also worked very hard to get here. At the time, you were contemplating raising money. You were also talking to Twitter and Jack Dorsey about selling to them, and then Mark Zuckerberg came into the picture. What happened? The acquisition happened fairly quickly. Mark and I decided that it was the right thing to do and basically closed over a weekend. I think it was like Easter weekend. 
I remember being at his house and us being like, all right, let's do this. Like, we're aligned. Lawyers were everywhere. We were signing documents. We were figuring this out. Um, and then it was a whirlwind, because I think we were in, you know, um, kind of this no man's land for six to nine months figuring out whether the deal would go through. Um, and once it did, we were able to partner. And immediately, the value became clear. Mm -hmm. Because we got together, we were able to fix our infrastructure. By the way, every day that went by, we were struggling to keep the site up, just struggling under our own growth. We were able to figure out spam really quickly. We were having this giant spam attack. And we got them in there and started using their tools immediately to fight spam. A lot of those things happened immediately after the acquisition and just helped the company grow and skyrocket. So why not Twitter? I think there were a lot of companies. There was Google. There were a bunch of others that were interested in Instagram's growth. Um, Facebook was the one that took it seriously. And I think Mark acted very quickly and decisively. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you look at the pairing now, and it just feels native. It feels like it makes sense. So Google was interested in buying you guys, too? I think every company at that point was. Uh, I don't think it was like Google specifically. It was just like companies were interested in what Instagram was up to. Mm -hmm. We were a bit of an anomaly, because like people would see us, and we would be 13 people. But at the same time, we had all this growth. And people kind of like couldn't get why those two things could be true at the same time. And I think a lot of people wrote off photos. I think no one quite understood how important photos would be for the, for the future of social media and expression. I mean, if you look at the way people express themselves now, it's not through just chat. It's through, like, photos and sending them to each other. No one quite understood that was the revolution that Instagram was about to embark on at the time. Facebook bought Instagram for about a billion dollars. A year later, Citigroup valued it at $35 billion. In that moment, did you ever think, oh, no, what did I just do? No, no, no. Um, I think every entrepreneur measures value on impact, or at least I hope they would. If you talk to Mark, I mean, he gave away 99% of his wealth. We're not in this game to make money. We're in this game to, like, change the world. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to entrepreneurs that matter, the Elons, the Larrys, the Sergeys, they all measure value based on, like, what do we just do for the world? Did we create something that didn't exist before? Did we unlock some kind of value? And that's what Mike and I focus on every single day. When Mark Zuckerberg bought your company, he pledged to, to let you work independently. Has he lived up to that? Mark has been true to his word and then some. Um, still to this day, Mark's interaction with the company basically is through meetings with me. And I've learned a tremendous amount from him about our transition to advertising, about our transition to a more global community, about strategy. He's one of the most interesting strategic, long-term strategic thinkers I've ever met. Think of it like having like the best board member in the world. I mean, mm. imagine how many companies would love to have Mark Zuckerberg on their board. That's what we get. And it, it's independent, but also you get amazing guidance and amazing counsel from someone who's been able to build a tremendous company. I think, you know, our transition to advertising was an interesting one. I was of the belief that if we had fewer advertisers, they'd be higher quality. And it actually turned out to be the opposite. If you have more advertisers and you're able to bring in an entire ecosystem where they compete against each other in an auction, you actually get higher quality advertisements. That's something that I didn't realize at the time. And I remember him saying, I felt the exact same way when we introduced advertising, and it turns out there's this other thing. I was able to learn a lot from him there. You mentioned you meet with not just Mark, but also Jan and, and Brendan. Yeah. How do you see Instagram taking advantage of some of the more futuristic things that Facebook is working on, like virtual reality? Well, if our vision is to make you feel like you can travel anywhere in the world in a fraction of a second and experience whatever's happening in the world, imagine a day when you can put on a headset and be at a Coldplay concert, seeing something happen like a big protest or a big riot anywhere in the world, or something as simple as a friend's wedding. That's the kind of experience we'd love to create, and I think virtual reality in the coming years will play a critical role in seeing that vision come true. How about artificial intelligence? Well, we use it today. I mean, that's what powers advertising and making sure that we have the right amount of targeting. Um, Do you see more of it in the future? Oh, for sure. I mean, one thing I've learned through the history of Instagram is that the more personalization you have, if we can have an experience that caters to you, you the individual, if we know your interests, if we know what you engage with, we can use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to make a much, much better experience for you on Instagram.
What about e-commerce? Do you think about adding a buy button to, to Instagram? Is, are there any plans for that? I'm really excited about the future of e-commerce on Instagram, where we start and where we end are two very different places. I mean, we effectively have a buy button right now. It just it doesn't complete the transaction on Instagram, and I think that's okay. Where we're starting is letting advertisers get to their audience, promote their own products or, or posts, and then basically from there, they take action on the advertiser's website. If we can make that more seamless in the future, of course we will. It's just we're starting to walk before we run. Who do you view as competition? Where do I start? <laughs> um, I mean, we as consumers only have limited amount of time to pull out our phones and do something. So anyone who's competing for time. One employee told us that they're concerned that Facebook and Instagram aren't more scared of Snapchat. Are you afraid enough of Snapchat? I don't think it's our job to be afraid so much as understand what's happening in the world. I think we are competing against many different services for time and eyeballs, et cetera. But getting to 500 million users around the world is a big feat. I mean, 300 million of those are daily actives. That's 300 million people that open up Instagram every single day, 21 minutes a day. That's a big feat. We are absolutely not sitting you know, happy thinking that that's going to last forever. We need to keep innovating and keep introducing products. Harassment is a problem across all of social media. Um, one singer recently reportedly attempted suicide after reading some comments on Instagram. Do you think Instagram needs to take a harder line here? I think we work very, very hard on it. We take every report of abuse or harassment very, very seriously. Um, we provide tools to a lot of our public figures to moderate their comments. And something we're focusing a lot on over the next year. It's unacceptable for that to exist on any platform, and we're going to be a platform that takes it very seriously, and we do take it very seriously. You redesigned your logo, which yeah. some people did not like. <laughs> There was a lot of drama when you hired Twitter's former head of product, Kevin Wheel, uh, especially given all the struggles they're going through. You are a product-focused CEO. 
How much impact can a head of product really have when you're the decider? Product management is also very different than product strategy. So building product is, is much more operational, is much more like the guts of the machine. How do you build product? Once you have an idea, how do you get it to become a reality? And that's something I think Kevin brings an amazing expertise uh, to Instagram. He has done that before. He's seen it at scale. I don't like to say I'm actually a good product manager. Um, I think the team will attest, but I love thinking strategically. So when you combine Kevin's personality and expertise and my personality and my expertise, not only do you get two Kevins, but you also get uh, a great pair that I think is kind of like a yin and a yang of the product process. I noticed you haven't used your Twitter handle much recently. You have a very simple Twitter handle, at Kevin, since you got there so early. Yeah. Do you think Twitter can turn itself around? Do you think Twitter can reaccelerate growth? Well, I probably should use my Twitter account. Um, it's actually an amazing platform, and I think every company at this point along their course of growth will hit speed bumps. It happens. It's happened to Instagram, it's happened to Facebook, and it's all about how you get out of that. And that's a hard question to answer from anyone's perspective, and I just respect a, a lot of what they've done in the past year. You mentioned that every day gets more complicated, but how much of Instagram's success has been a focus and commitment to simplicity? I think that's actually the complex part of Instagram, is like, it's easy to let a product get bloated it's easy to say to every employee, you know what, guys, just go work on it, whatever you want, we'll see what sticks. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, you've got a product that's all over the place, it doesn't have a singular voice, mm -hmm. um, and that itself is complex. Managing to get something to be simple and be straightforward, even though it has a tremendous amount of complexity behind the scenes, that's the hardest part of any CEO's job, uh, is actually saying no more than you say yes. What are some features that you pondered or threw around that you ultimately said no? Well, we had a lot of people asking for sponsored filters at one point. I think like there was a toothpaste company that wanted a teeth whitening filter and like, I just, uh, that's a funny example, uh -huh. but it makes sense because it's like, oh, we got filters, we should probably just do sponsored versions. We focus on simplicity and doing the right thing by the consumer, which is like to not make them so commercial, make them great, and, and focus on what people love most about them. There are decisions like that every day that are like easy, you can make a few bucks probably by doing them, but they end up adding complexity to the product and it doesn't actually add a lot to your bottom line either. You redesigned your logo, which yeah. some people did not like. <laughs> Ad Week, Who, really? <laughs> Ad Week uh, called it a travesty. Uh, yeah. What did you learn from that? I knew going into it that it would be a difficult change. Uh, there's not a single company I've seen, whether you're Starbucks or Gap, right, like that has changed their logo and it has been easy. Uh -huh. There's not a single company. Um, I think the question is, how much work have you put into it before you get there? How much resolve do you have? Are you doing it for the right reasons? What we wanted to do was give people an idea that we weren't just about photography. We were more general than that. We were about creativity, thus the colors, thus the simplicity. Mm -hmm. We wanted something that would scale across different mediums, that would look great on a phone, great on a t-shirt, great on a billboard, great anywhere. Our current logo, or at least the one that we had, wouldn't do that. As much as I love it because I, I had a heavy hand in designing it, right? The current one I didn't have a heavy hand in other than helping the team along. Um, we have an amazing design team that thought through all these things. They did this awesome presentation of the evolution of brands throughout time. And what you see with every brand is that it goes from being complex to simpler and simpler and simpler to iconic. Mm -hmm. You can do that with Apple, AT&T, you name it, the big brands, they do this. Mm -hmm. We just skipped a few parts. parts. <laughs> and that's okay because it's going to be hard. What did I learn? It's hard. <laughs> what did I also learn? It's going to be okay. Your timeline is now algorithmic as opposed yeah. to reverse chronological. Some people also didn't like that. How's that worked out? Um, is, it, is, it, is it working the way that you hoped, even sure. though some people weren't? Yes, it's absolutely working the way we hoped. I mean, engagement is up because of it. Um, it means that people are liking Instagram more. Uh, they have more feedback on their posts, more feedback on the posts that they actually want to give feedback to. Um, the good news about an algorithmic feed is that unlike um, what people believe, it's not actually not chronological, it's fairly chronological. It just takes the stuff that you haven't seen and it reorders it to make sure that you see the best stuff at the top. People miss more than 70% of their feed and that's not okay with us. It's not okay to them. You've been traveling around the world, you're at fashion shows, you're at major events. What have the last few years been like for you personally? 
I don't think I would say like the nerd in high school would be at a fashion show someday. <laughs> it still feels weird, but um, I go to these things because I am a representative of the brand and of Instagram. And I believe by having relationships with people in these different industries, whether it's the Pope and onboarding the Pope or doing fashion dinners with Anna Wintour, those things are like, uh, they couldn't be more different but they're both extremely important to the community on Instagram. You personally onboarded the Pope, not yeah. and you, you met him not once but twice. Yeah. What was that like? Really inspirational. I mean, there are not many moments in life when you think, um, first of all, like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. uh, but also, when it happens, you realize, I'm going to remember this moment for my entire life. When you realize that you can onboard someone who will go down in the history books for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and that they are choosing your product to connect with the people that care most about their message, that's awesome. Now, Silicon Valley is accused of being arrogant and filled with overnight billionaires, and I realize that's an exaggeration for pretty much everyone, but if anyone comes close to that story, it's you. You, you, you made a billion dollars, over, you know, not overnight, but you made a lot of money. How have you adjusted to that personally? Um, you know, it's not an easy answer because I'm not sure there's any guidebook for it. What you begin to realize is that money matters in the sense that it puts a roof above your head and it feeds you and your family. But beyond that, what matters most is your impact in the world, your relationships with people, your family, your friends. I think what you realize is like a lot of people work their entire lives to make more money and it's this fruitless kind of voyage when really what you should be aimed at is what's your impact in the world. Do you think you've changed at all personally? Or how have you changed personally? For sure. I've had to learn a lot. Um, you know, someone who didn't manage a single person six years ago, now we've got a, a big team of 500 plus people. That makes you change fairly quickly. You learn a lot of patience. You learn how to communicate a little bit more clearly. Um, you learn to have resolve through tough situations, not just personnel situations, but company situations. You learn to ride the bumps a little bit more easily. You're 32 years old. Do you ever want to start something new? Yeah, totally. I mean, in some ways, like, that's, um, I mean, whether it's philanthropically or, um, like, helping other people start businesses. So the way I do this now is I do angel investing, and that's how I scratch that itch right now. And um, there are lots of ways to have impact without starting another company. What's your single piece of advice for aspiring entrepreneurs. It sounds cheesy, but like the one piece of advice I got is just to follow your passion. I turned down so many jobs that would have paid more or like would have been the quote unquote right thing to do coming out of a school like Stanford. And I just did what I loved. Kevin Sistrom, co-founder and CEO of Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you. They're doing this. This is great.